can start with who I am. My name is Kelly Alsup. I am a horticulture educator and for the University of Illinois Extension. I am uh, in my third year now. I uh, serve Livingston, McLean, and Woodford counties and I have somewhat of an expertise in integrated pest management and I just simply love insects. But one of my other interests are, is um, organic gardening and different methods of vegetable gardening, which is why straw bell gardening really, um, I, it got my interest and I did a little bit of it last year and I'm doing it on a much grander scale this year. And so I'll talk a little bit about my own experiences and about um, the book, obviously. So um, I do have a, um, a picture that I always put up and this is a picture taken from the University of Illinois greenhouse when I worked there. Uh, what we're doing here, this is a pepper plant and we were actually um, letting aphids um, grow on this pepper plant because they were getting parasitized by um, little tiny wasps. And we wanted to keep that population going so we could um, put it in other rooms in the greenhouse. Well, because we didn't spray, we actually had some volunteers. And you see this, this little guy, he's an aphid lion. He's hanging upside down. He's got an aphid in his mouth. And he is the larva of a very common garden insect that you guys see all the time called a green lacewing. They're um, normally eating nectar. And this guy lives about seven to ten days in this life cycle, and he will eat hundreds and hundreds of aphids. If he doesn't eat them, he'll stab them and throw them to the ground. So if you have green lace wings in your garden, um, you would always want to make sure that not to spray because you probably have the larva and he's probably taking care of your aphid or um, other small invertebrates in the garden. So um, it's always good to not only look for the pest, but to look for those beneficial insects. Um, but yes, I am talking about straw bell gardening today. I, I got interested in the topic. Um, just like probably all of you, in 2012, Joel Carlston wrote a book called Straw Bell Gardening. It's a really good book, a really easy read. Um, some of you just being horticulturists and gardeners can grasp the concept without even reading the book, but it was worth the read. He also has Facebook and a website. Um, what I loved about it is kind of, it's a, you know, sort of a nerdy way to garden because I am a horticulturist, but I really feel like I'm kind of a scientist also. So I uh, commonly refer to it as growing vegetables in a compost pile because what you're doing is you are breaking down the straw at the same time you're growing in it. So it's kind of like he calls it a breakthrough method for growing vegetables anywhere. Um, whether it be in your driveway, on that sunny spot in your um, yard where the soil is horrible, or um, like me, being a little non-committal, not wanting to break up the ground and amend the soil or build a bed. Um, just a really great method to grow vegetables temporarily. Plus, um, everyone's favorite, um, the uh, minimal weeding. Uh, I don't know about you, but I think my master gardeners in McLean County absolutely love weeding um, most of the time. But uh, sometimes, uh, you know, when you um, have all these great aspirations to do this amazing vegetable garden, those weeds can really get away from you. And then they're usually uh, a vector for insects or diseases, and they suck up nutrients away from the actual plant you want to grow. Um, the next slide, this is one of his straw bells. 
Um, what I, it really, um, it, it's uh, what Rhonda Faree says, it really solves every impediment that a gardener may face, whether it be I started straw bells here at the office. I started 25 straw bells. I walked out behind the office, uh, checked out the soil. It was really bad soil. I knew that I would have to amend the soil if I wanted to grow vegetables. So um, I didn't even have to worry about this soil anymore. Um, it, um, it makes for a longer growing season because the straw bells warm up much faster than the soil. Um, the watering, um, you might have to water a little bit more if we have, you know, really hot, dry conditions, but the straw really is constructed in a way that it absorbs and keeps water. And then a lot of us, like myself, have limited garden space and you know, what better to just go get a bale of straw and grow your zucchini or your tomato plants or your herbs. And then another thing that I really like about straw bale gardening is it kind of raises it up to your level because I think, uh, you know, we're starting, you know, hunching over to pull those weeds or hunching over to do your work. Um, uh, you know, the a, a more ergonomic way of gardening. And then my favorite part is I did not really have to commit. I didn't have to till up a bed. I didn't have to build some raised beds and go through this really long process of preparing a garden bed. And And then it's not really a new concept. It's kind of something that people growing potatoes have done before. I'm sure many horticulturists um, have grown, you know, potatoes in layers of straw. And why they would do this is because it's so much easier to harvest potatoes in straw than it is the ground. Because we all know, you know, when you're harvesting those potatoes, you nick that skin, that's the first one you've got to eat. And um, you, you can't keep that potato for much longer. Uh, I do. He says in his book that you'll never grow potatoes any other way. But um, potatoes really require uh, temperatures between 60 and 70 degrees to keep growing. And once it becomes a little bit higher than that, they're actually going to cease growing a little bit. And so um, what I think we're going to find is that we'll have great we'll have potatoes we'll have it'll be easy to harvest but they might be a little bit smaller than the ones you would have grown in your ground another thing is um, you're eliminating those soil borne diseases um, we all talk about crop rotation don't plant your tomatoes where your potatoes were last year make sure your eggplant isn't planted in all those families and then you have to do your cucurbits and then I don't know about you but we I don't have a big enough garden to even do crop rotation sometimes so this kind of eliminates those soil borne diseases and then because the temperature of those straw bells remain a little bit higher you have a, a little bit higher seed germination because temperature is all, all um, is directly related to how fast the, the, the seeds germinate. And uh, I just think that, you know, that loose, beautiful straw, the roots actually grow a little bit better. And um, everybody, uh, any gardener, you know, good roots, good shoots. So you have really great root growth. You're going to have really great shoot growth and therefore more flowers and more fruits. Um, wh where do you get your straw bells? Um, I find that even the high-end garden centers will have straw bells, but I like to go to the farm stores. They're definitely going to have the straw bells. What they've used them for, what most people use straw bells for, is bedding for animals. It can be uh, made out of oats, wheat, barley, rice, or flax. And... Uh, it's a really super absorbent material. You can actually use like a leftover straw bell for maybe your fall display, the fall before the spring. Um, another uh, 
source is if you are having some issues finding straw bells, you can go to www.strawbell.com and that could uh, potentially find you a better uh, a place to purchase those. So the straw is really, you know, this super absorbent. It uh, The water really gets trapped in those hollow s straw stems and then it must either be evaporated or used by the plants. So you're not really going to lose a lot of water. It's really going to suck it up. And then um, uh, you're, so then it'll also be used by the plant. And therefore, if it evaporates, then you're going to water the straw. I've actually started my straw bell, and it has remained wet um, a, lo a long time. Obviously, the only way that I can get the water out is by evaporation. But uh, as soon as I plant, I'm sure the plants are going to use up that water and I might have to water a little bit more. Now, everybody, I always get this asked this question, can I use hail? I meant hay, excuse me. Um, I guess that was a Freudian slip meaning hay bale. Can I use a hay bale? And the answer to that is you would be... Um, it's just kind of the same concept. Um, uh, you know, hay is going to break down the same way that straw is going to break down. But hay is really baled grass or alfalfa. And this is fodder for land livestock. So what is going to happen if you use a hay bale, you are going to have a ton of weeds. Because in those hay bales is a lot of grass and alfalfa seed. So... Um, would I use hay? No way. I would really, really try to um, use the straw. Designing the bales. You know, uh, everybody's always like, uh, can I grow vegetables in shade? And the answer is absolutely not. That's part of the reason of using a straw bell. You're going to find a really sunny location. Even if it's not a great place for a garden, you can use a straw bell. So full sun is important. Uh, single filed rows. Now you can double them up, you know, just as long as you can reach the middle from each side. Um, maybe four to six feet between rows. I think we left about three or four feet between our rows, and I actually thought I was going to have to put down mulch, but find out the lawnmower went right between the rows, so uh, I'm good for that. You always do the cut side up because the strings are actually going to maintain that container shape. And then north to south rows, always north to south rows when you're growing vegetables. Um, you're going to plant those um, taller stuff on the north side and the shorter stuff on the south side because that's where you're going to get the most sun. You can double stack a bale, but you're going to want to lay down the bale with the strings on the top and then put the other one on the top. Um, the way that it's shown here in the picture. And you can replant them. Um, for instance, uh, if you grow a cool weather spinach crop and then want to put in, you know, a, uh, you know, beets in July or you want to put in some, um, some uh, late uh, planted cucumbers, um, you could go ahead and replant that. Um, keeping some space between the rows that's actually going to help increase some air circulation and we know that without air circulation then we start to get a lot of disease issues. Um, I actually hauled these with um, a cart but um, using a tarp I think is a better idea. They're really heavy when they get wet unless you are wanting a um, workout there um, you know just put it on a tarp and drag it across the lawn or drag it wherever you need it to be and then um, you know any uh, farm kid knows that if you handle straw without gloves you are going to get these red marks on your arms um, I didn't. I wore I wore a flannel and gloves when I was handling it, but my colleague did not, and she definitely got some straw burn. 
So this is real. This next part, the actual cooking of the bell, is really the sciency part. That's where we're we're creating this compost pile. So you don't just directly plant the straw bell. You cook it first, and the way that you cook it is you start to add water and fertilizer, especially fertilizer high in nitrogen. So what this water does is it starts feeding the bacteria. So does the nitrogen. And the more the bacteria multiplies and is fed, the faster the straw bell is actually going to break down into soil, the exact same way your compost pile does. You're going to do about a pound of fertilizer per bale. Now, I did all organic, and so that means two to three times more fertilizer because we see, we know that organic, if you know, you know how you have an organic fertilizer, is that the numbers are going to be really low. They're going to be like two, three, four, rather than 20, 10, 20. Uh, you know, if you have really high numbers, then that would be a synthetic fertilizer. Um, I have used organic uh, all the times so that I've done it just because I've grown vegetables and herbs. But um, in the book, it doesn't really matter. You can use a synthetic. You can use the same kind of fertilizer that you use on your lawn just as long as it's a high nitrogen. So that bacteria is going to start multiplying and consuming that straw. That nitrogen is speeding up that bacteria. If you were to not feed, put put the nitrogen on the straw, it would take about a year for that 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 straw bell to really break down. Um, I put up a recipe here, and this is a recipe that I got from the book. But uh, I am a lazy gardener, and I do not like following rules myself. So I did not follow these rules exactly, and it still worked. And he actually had a like a whole page in the book where he talked about how he did all these different um, uh, recipes of cooking the bail. And it didn't matter what kind of recipe he used, but this is just a great starter. You know, day one, you add your three cups of organic fertilizer. That would be, you know, um, you know, one cup if it were um, uh, inorganic, like a synthetic. And what I really mean is um, I've actually had people um, ask me, how do you convert that really to like a diluted fertilizer? So that would be probably um, about three gallons of diluted fertilizer would be what I would do it, would put on it. Um, and then day four through six, you're going to add a cup of organic fertilizer or a gallon of diluted fertilizer. Day seven through nine, you're going to add a half a cup. And um, then day 10, you're going to add three cups of fish or bone meal. And this is because they're actually, he, he says that because he's thinking you're going to be using really high nitrogen. But I'm not, I know, I, you know, I'm using a, a well-balanced fertilizer. So I am going to do the bone meal at the end just to get that, um, just to get that phosphorus in there. But that's one of the things that they're finding that if you just put nitrogen on, nitrogen on, then um, you need to make sure that you have those other nutrients um, represented also. Uh, another question that I always get is can you use compost? And absolutely you can use composted manure as long as it is composted. But know that when you use composted manure, you're going to have really high nitrogen and you're going to have to think about adding that phosphorus in. And one way that you could do that would be wood ash or this fish or bone meal. The organic fertilizer I'm using actually has feather, it's like a feather meal. So that's going to be high in nitrogen. So you're going to let this cook for about 10 to 12 days. And... Um, you do not when you start to actually plant it is not going to be broken down you're you may see a little bit of peppering the soil starting to to form but you're really going to have to get in there and even maybe even use a, a tool to cut away some of the straw um, to plant your plants but 
um, the bacteria really has begun. And the way that you know that the bacteria has begun is by the temperature. And I'll show that a little bit later. So here's like the organic fertilizer that you just sprinkle on the top. And um, that's all I did. I just sprinkled it on the top. I kept watering it. Yes, it stayed on the top a little bit. But the more I water it, the more it goes into the middle. Um, uh, one, another thing to know about the fertilizers, you can't really use a slow-release fertilizer because we want action in the first 10 to 12 days. And slow-release really breaks down according to temperature. And that's why it's something that will last three months. So slow-release would not be a good option for here. Um, here, starting to cook the bales with the water, you see, uh, I love the, the University of California Extension Master Food Preservers has really done a lot of research, and they have a lot on their website, um, and that's where I got most of my pictures. Um, you see this guy is wearing um, a sweatshirt, so he started really early. And I know it's, uh, you know, it's May 28th, and people are getting a little nervous, but this is, it would be a perfect time to go out and get a straw bell and start now. And actually, I actually say that straw bell gardening is perfect for the lazy gardener because you can even, you can actually start a little bit later than traditional gardeners are starting in their traditional garden. So you can, you know, even go all the way up until, you know, the end of June. Yeah, if you, if you grow some, zucchini which I'm gonna plant my zucchini at the end of June this year my zucchini because I'm gonna try to get um, I'm gonna try to uh, miss out on that first population of cucumber beetles because those things are awful and I want to try to be organic and so yeah I might be compromising a little bit of my harvest time but zucchini is so aggressive and lots of lots of vegetables that I still think I'm going to get a good crop no matter how late I um, I do it so I'm probably going to do it late June maybe even early July um, again, this I'm going to be experimenting. Um, I know a lot of organic growers, you know, um, are always thinking about, you know, when is the best time to plant? If you plant a little bit later, are you missing out on egg laying insects? And uh, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to plant my my zucchini a little bit later. Cooking the bale, I mean, it's going to get up to about 160 degrees. And you know that when you see these temperatures get up there, that you know bacteria is working. Bacteria, it, it, you know, when it feeds and starts producing that soil, the, it, it releases heat, and this is how you know. And, you know, you go up to a good compost pile, and it would be about 160 degrees. And e even though you're wanting bacteria to work, you're actually killing off some harmful bacteria also at this degrees. And then when you go to plant, um, you want that temperature to get back down to at least 105. If you're going to plant plants, if you're just going to do seed germination, then remember I said, you know, higher temperatures, better seed germination. When I used to be a grower in a greenhouse, you know, we used to put our, our seed flats on a, um, on a heating pad, I would cover it with newspaper and plastic to keep the moisture in, to keep that warmth in, and I wouldn't uncover it until um, I actually got some seed germination, and then until my whole flat was full of germinated seeds would I take it off the heating pad. So, you know, that extra heat actually would be beneficial for your seeds. Here's mushrooms. Um, I, I get, I've gotten some questions about these where, um, you know, they were actually, it's a really good sign for you to have these mushrooms. They're going to grow for only about a few weeks. It means stuff's going on. It means, you know, there's bacteria, there's fungal growth. Um, 
the the lady that sent me a picture she sent me a picture and the whole entire top was covered with these mushrooms and they kept pushing out her newly planted seeds and i said you know just wait a little bit longer um to plant the seeds and uh you know maybe let it dry down a little bit they might go away but you know they only grow for a couple of weeks it's a really good sign and the only the unfortunate part is that you cannot eat these even though they kind of don't look very appetizing they look kind of oily and slick um but you know you know something's going on planting the bale um when uh you show in the left side do this little pocket design so you might you know really have to get in there with that trowel and maybe even use some pruners to prune out some of that straw to get a nice planting hole now I always put um, a little bit of soil at the bottom of my planting hole and then a little bit of soil at the top when I do transplants and then when you do um, when you do seeds, you put a nice layer of soil, and then you put down your paper towels, and you put your seeds on top of the paper towel, and then you put some soil on top, and then you always water germinating seed. You could put newspaper over it um, to help, and the plastic to help it stay moist and warm, but. Um, germinating seed always needs to be watered it, it can't dry down the reason why we're putting the paper towel on it is because um, it, you know you're gonna water it in and then it's going to go everywhere but if you put the paper towel then the seeds will probably stay in place that paper towel will break down after a while um, again I just wanted to um, show you that don't expect that soil formation this is this is actually showing some of the organic fertilizer this is what my bales look like right now um, don't really expect to see um, soil formation when you are planting um, don't feel like that that is a way to judge that it's working it's actually the heat um, in this picture I um, became friends with a uh, a master gardener from Lee County during a training session and we uh, Facebooked and he gave me some pictures and it actually shows him kind of stabilizing the bales a little bit um, I, I'm gonna do a different strategy uh, I'm actually gonna plant in the side of the bales with some annuals but I think this was really clever putting the you know the log on the side and then using the um, fence posts this is actually where I got my inspiration from, um, oh, I can't think of the county. I know Jennifer Nelson Schultz um, from Decatur. Uh, ha I did this also where I um, had a little movable cart. I put my straw bell in it and I grew my herbs and put a little sign on it. It was just a really cool idea and movable gardens are actually really really popular and so they can just like move it right up to the water move it where the sunniest spot is move it out of the way if they needed to use the and that's exactly what I did I put mine on a sidewalk in the sunniest spot just moved it out of the way when I didn't moved and, um, and it produced tons of herbs I like the I like the idea of doing a trellis system right away. Um, uh, you know, I think that's one of the biggest problems when it, with tomatoes is you go, you plant your tomato deep, you plant these amazing varieties, and then you don't then you don't stake it right away, or you try to stake it with one of those little tiny three foot stakes, and we know that those don't work. That your tomato plant will be on the ground, but you will. Here is a really cool staking method where they actually are using trellises with those fence posts, and then he's using that four by six um, piece of lumber, two by four, excuse me, piece of lumber to keep those fence posts from shifting. Well, um, and then it also shows a really cool way to trellis your tomatoes. Um, this is something that 
you know, vegetable growers do all the time. They always trim their tomatoes to one liter, meaning, you know those, uh, I'm pointing at the screen, um, you know when at the node where the uh, branch meets the main stem, you'll actually have other, um, other uh, branches try to go, try to uh, come out. Well, you just go ahead and you pinch those out. From the very beginning, as you start trellising it, you pinch those out. And yes, you're going to have a few less fruits, but you're going to have far easier time of harvesting and keeping that plant up off of the ground. And the fruits are actually probably going to be a little bit bigger if you sacrifice the, those little tiny shoots at those nodes. Um, here uh, in this left picture, you see him affixing the wire to the post. Um, he put down some drip irrigation. Uh, here on the left side, this is actually what I'm going to do. I'm going to plant um, pretty flowers in the sides of the bale. Uh, yeah, they're definitely going to lose a little bit of their shape, but if I plant the flowers in the side, then maybe it'll stay better together. Um, stay together more like a container. Plus, you know, um, I'm a horticulturist and I like pretty flowers, so I I just want to make a whole experience of it. And so I'm going to use some New Guinea impatiens. I've decided to use some bonefire begonias. I'm going to do mint and oregano in the sides of the bales, and that actually gives me like a whole some great some more surface area to actually grow in. Irrigating the bales. Um, I'm going to use a soaker hose. I'm going to use a rain barrel. I do think that, you know, thinking about how you're going to water it could be a really great, um, you know, a really great way to, you know, get your ta summer gardening task down a little bit. Um, I'm already taking away the, uh, the weeding, so why not have a little bit of irrigation? And then, um, you know, you can use soaker hoses. We actually are going to use some soaker hoses in our straw bales. And we're going to do a rain barrel so I can, um, and I'm going to do that at time of planting. And um, just to make it a little bit easier. Yeah, you're going to spend a little bit more money on these soaker hoses. But when you think about how much water you're actually wasting when you use a sprinkler, um, you it, you just can't even compare the cost. I think uh, I remember reading in a, a, a turf article that it was, uh, and you know, Kari may want to uh, correct me or Candace, that it was like 60 or 70 percent loss. So only when you're doing a sprinkler, only 30 percent of that water is actually going on the plants. So, yeah, it's easier, but you're wasting a lot of water. And I, even though in Illinois, water seems to be, you know, uh, not, not a depleting resource, but um, I do think, you know, being um, good with the water is something that most gardeners should shoot for. Um, you want to definitely do monthly fertilizer applications because, again, that straw is not, you know, it's not soil. It's not as dynamic as soil, and you're not going to have a lot of nutrients in there. So even though, you know, usually when uh, people ask me about fertilizing vegetables, I say, you know, first of all, I always tell them to take a soil test because I do think we over-fertilize a little bit. But, you know, just a general rule of thumb for me is I always fertilize about two to three weeks after I plant. And then according to the vegetables, I might fertilize when it starts flowering. But then I don't fertilize that much more. Um, again, one of those plants that's a really heavy feeder is tomatoes. You could probably fertilize them all the time. They'd be happy. But then you have those um, indeterminate ones where if you fertilize them too much, 
when they start to flower, you're going to get too much vegetative growth. So um, just go ahead and do a, a, you know, a monthly application. Just put it on your calendar of fertilizers. And then another thing is, you know, watch out for some of those nutrient deficiencies. You know, all of the leaves look kind of yellow, not so green. Then a nice little fertilizer treatment will probably turn that around in just a few days. Um, I I think this picture is funny because um, I, mean, I, I I being a horticulturist I understand you know the um, rules of watering with you know capillary action and adhesion but I still don't know if putting a two liter bottle in the side of it is going to work. I think uh, you probably want to spread that water out a little bit more. I'm intrigued to see it. It's actually from Washington State University. Um, maybe it works. Uh, I don't know, but I'm a little skeptical of this one. Tomato comparison. Uh, you know, why is the tomato in the straw bells looks so much healthier than the tomato that's planted in the ground? And I really think it's that root to shoot kind of ratio thing. When I worked in the greenhouse and we had a poor looking plant, the first thing we did was look at the roots. If the roots weren't healthy, we were never going to have a good plant. So, uh, I, you know, uh, I have gardeners all the time when I'm planting annuals, the first thing I do is I'll pinch off the tops or I'll take off all the flowers because I don't care about flowers and tops at that point in time. I care about roots. I get good root growth in the beginning. I'll have more flowers later on in the season. And then um, you really support your tomatoes. He, um, he has some great recipes, but you guys know that those three foot ones don't work. You need to get, you need to actually make your six foot tall one. Maybe even put a fence post in there to keep it in place, or do the um, do the other um, trellising that we showed you earlier in the PowerPoint. Um, harvest. Um, I love this list of flowers, plants, there are so many different plants that you can actually use. You can do, you know, two squash plants per bale, two tomato plants per bale. You can plant three potatoes. Um, you can do 48 carrots. And supposedly the carrots look so much better too because they don't have to deal with soil diseases or soil insects. And they don't like, you know, uh, they'll twist and turn if they have come near a rock and so they don't have to deal with all of that. Um, I'm actually going to do some annual bulbs for cut flowers um, just because I think uh, I, it, it'll be fun but and plus I want flowers with my vegetables because I do want some good bugs to come near the garden. We know that flowers will bring those good bugs just like my first example where the green lacewing um, she's not going to come and lay her um, egg with that larva that's going to be such a good guy in my garden if she doesn't have some nectar herself. So I'm going to do some bulbs and then I think it'll be easy for me to keep overwinter those bulbs by just, you know, breaking up the straw bale. Here's some potatoes. They're looking kind of smaller. But look how easy it is to harvest. And then we see some nice root crops, some carrots and some beets. Um, look at this beautiful cabbage. Now, um, my least favorite thing about growing cabbage is that cabbage butterfly. So you could actually, and a lot of organic vegetable growers do this, where they put a white frost cloth. And I think I show it in the next slide. I think I showed it a little bit earlier. You saw it in Wolfgang's um, thing. But they actually put a white frost cloth, which is something that you might have gone and it'll be wrapping, wrapped a Christmas tree. But you'll put a white frost cloth on it, and then it'll actually prevent any insect from coming, just plain 
out exclusion. It'll prevent insects from coming and laying their eggs, and those cabbage white butterflies would never be able to lay their eggs. Now, it kind of looks ugly having white frost cloth over your beautiful cabbage heads, but um, I'd much rather do that than spray a chemical or be out there every day trying to pick off those worms, you know, it, it takes a while, um, I, you know, it's like one or two days you miss seeing them and you have some really decimated plants. Um, another, with the white frost cloth, it's what a lot of organic vegetable growers do to just exclude. Now, I could put it over cabbage until cabbage is ready. It actually will allow sun penetration. It'll allow water. It's actually about 80% sun penetration. Um, and I could keep it over cabbage during the whole entire crop if I had to. Um, it, obviously, the cucumbers and the squash, I could keep it only up until those flowers actually needed some pollination. Um, but sometimes just that first two or three weeks of exclusion in a vegetable crop is enough to prevent some of the devastating pest infestations that you may have. That another, which is another reason why I'm waiting till the end of June to plant my my zucchini. I love this one. Um, I hate squash bugs. Again, I think uh, you know it's hard to you know I, I don't know how well rotation works when it comes to squash bugs. It's you, you have them before. You had them last year. You're probably going to have them this year. If you don't catch them when they're eggs and nymphs and you actually have adults, you are never going to be able to take care of it organically. Um, so organic-wise, you would cover this in the beginning for two or three weeks just to prevent some of that egg laying. Then you would go through and you'd find those orange eggs and you'd either pick off those leaves because they don't need all those leaves. And... You could do an insecticidal soap, and then when these actually, the squash bugs hatch, the nymphs actually stay congregated together. They look like little spiders, and they don't really move away from each other, so that's a really great time to spray some insecticidal soap on them, too. But once those squash bugs get to be adults, that insecticidal soap doesn't work so well. Um, here's a, a design from that University of California Master Food Preservers from a before to an after where it's really showing how it, this stuff is growing really well. Uh, surprise, surprise, mint is growing well. Um, I'm going to grow some mint too. Um, excuse me, dill. Dill is going growing well. I'm going to grow some mint and some dill also in our straw bells. And because I'm doing it in a straw bell, I'm actually... Um, you know, preventing it from spreading in the ground, even though I do think if I let the mint go to seed, there will be some seedlings in the grass next year, but that's something that can easily be taken care of by a lawnmower, and then, you know, hey, who doesn't want more dill? But, um, I am growing our bells. I'm going to have, I have 4-H kids helping me. <laughs> So I'm going to teach the 4-H kids how to do it. I'm having master gardeners help me. And then I'm going to do a lot of blogging. And then all of the produce is going to go to our nutrition and SNAP-Ed um, educators. And I think a lot of units do this around the state where the horticulturist and the master gardeners, you know, help with a raised bed or something. And they make sure that these nutrition educators get some fresh herbs because we want them to teach about fresh herbs and fresh vegetables. But, you know, they can be really expensive. And when you're constantly, you know, buying for programs, I actually feel like, um, you know, I will probably make some friends with a nutrition educator. She'll be really happy to get some of these fresh herbs. And um, so she actually requested dill and mint. I said I would do it. Here's that insect protection I was talking about. Wolfgang Schmitz uh, on this side. I actually think he's not doing that for insect protection, but I think he was doing it for frost protection. You see in the right, there's the... the um, the uh, 
the plastic for frost protection. I don't know about you guys, but we actually had a frost here maybe a week or two ago, and it kind of nipped my basil. It nipped some of my house plants, but um, then I uh, put a uh, I put a bed sheet over my house plants. But this this plastic would have worked just great if you had say started this in March. And then this, if this in the left picture, this this insect protection, it, it obviously the top is open and there's a bottom gap, so that would not do well with insect protection. But you would actually lay it over the plants the way you see the plastic, and you would weigh it down with bricks. That way they couldn't go under. I love this picture. I think it's awesome. I mean. Uh, he says that you can pretty much grow everything but corn, but then he shows that he's growing sunflowers, which, you know, uh, pretty high up there. I mean, they're tall, and they're not really staked. I see some of them are lodging just a little bit, but um, I'm sure if he let that um, dry down, they'd be on the ground. But um, what a cool front yard to have all these straw bells with these beautiful sunflowers and then all you do is just mow between the rows and he's doing one of the concepts I want want to do right here is creating that skirt of annuals around the base and, then, and here's my blog um, flowers fruits and frass and um, frass just so you know is insect excrement uh, because flowers fruits and insects just wouldn't quite sound as good um, so uh, I love doing like real-time blogging even though obviously lately I've been doing a lot of vegetable stuff but I'm gonna really blog a lot about our own personal straw bell throughout the the garden season so if you you know don't have time to try it and you want to see how it works for me first then go to the blog and you'll see me um, update it every now and then and talk about the blog and then talk about the straw bell gardening excuse me and then another thing that I always do is I go when I see insects in the garden is I'll blog about them and then I'll blog about organic methods and other beneficial insects that may be eating those insects that um, so you don't have to always go out and spray some chemicals on them. Um, I'm Kelly Alsup. I serve Livingston, McLean, and Woodford County. I'm not at 402 North Hershey anymore. Our office just moved. I'm at 1615 Commerce Parkway. Um, still in Bloomington, Illinois. Phone number is the same. Email is the same. Um, just so you know, uh, if you're a master gardener, you can get continued education credits for um, watching some of these past four season gardening series on YouTube. So what a great way to get some extra education um, at home, you know, or at night, and you can get some of those continued ed credits. But for all of you that aren't master gardeners, um, you know, just go and type in University of Illinois. Oh, I guess you can just go to this website here and see all these pa really cool past webinars. And not they're not as cool as mine, but um, they'll, they'll be pretty good. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Hey, Candace, what did you think about my comment of none of you guys' workshops are as cool as mine? <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. What? I don't know I if heard... that's accurate. <laughs> uh, I, I, I do think that all the whore educators in, in our region are actually wanting to do something, uh, some... We, we just did a good, bad, and lovely where we talked about some landscape invasives and some native alternatives. And I think the next thing that we want to talk about is sustainable agriculture, sustainable landscaping, which, you know, essentially means that you source all your materials locally and you make things more sustainable and you're not going to use some of these um, practices that we tend to use that are just easier.
Kelly, we have a question in Fulton County. Okay. Would this, would this be a good application for land that formerly ha had uh, black walnuts growing on it? I do think that, you know, some of the, so, you know, it could be if you uh, didn't put, you know, maybe a weed barrier on it, you would get some of that soil straw um, contact. But if you put like newspaper, I know newspaper breaks down, but newspaper or weed barrier, I think it would be perfect. I have another, would growing pumpkins do well with this method? Absolutely, just so you know. Um, you can actually grow pumpkins up on a trellis as long as they're less than four to five pounds, some mini pumpkins. I know you guys don't want the mini ones, but I think growing pumpkins would be excellent. Do you put organic fertilizer on dry or do you mix it with water first? I, I guess it really depends on the or, or, on the fertilizer, but all the organic fertilizers that I've used, you just sprinkle it on dry. Joined late due to the problems and had to call in. Does any straw or is it a special straw? Well, as long as it's not a hay bale and it's a straw bale made out of um, oats, wheat, barley, rice, or flax. The one you go to the you go to the store and you ask for uh, the stuff that they use for bedding of like maybe if they have a dog outside or you know pigs or goats or something. Um, what kind of wire did you use to make the trellis? Well, we just used a, a thin utility wire. I don't, I don't know how to really answer that question. I'm sorry. Um, pumpkin seeds in the top or the side? I think you could only probably use about two or three seeds. You might, that might be growing pumpkins might be a great way to, you know, put, you know, two back to back. You know. Uh, uh, we're uh, the McLean County Master Gardeners are going to go to Arkansas this this year to see P. Allen Smith. He's kind of the the Elvis of of, of horticulture, but um, he uh, when he does his raised beds, he doesn't put soil in it. He puts straw in it, and he just starts growing in straw. And I'm sure this is, and I think this is how he does his pumpkins. Can you use straw bell gardening with hydroponics? What? Uh, I, 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 I don't know. Um, I would think that it would be straw aponics if you use straw. But I know I'm awful. Um, but, um, you know, it is clean. I mean, it does have antibacterial properties. That's why they use it for bedding. I think it would be a pretty interesting concept. Um, please repeat the name of the author of the book. That would be, that would be Joe Carlston, J-O-E-L-K-A-R-S-T-E-N. It's called Straw Bell Gardenings, Gardens. Um, he's a, he is, um, he does have a, a horticulture degree and he talks about, you know, traditional gardening and just some great gardening basics. He has some excellent pictures, but just so you know, he has a website and a Facebook page also. What is the spacing for aeration when the bales are end to end? Well, I do put them end to end, but it's about three to five feet between the rows. I hope I'm answering that. I hope that's how I'm interpreting the question. And I did that. You know, we do want good aeration because we want less diseases, but I also did that because of the lawnmower. So just so you know, you guys, um, you know, if you can get your hands on some straw bell, get some organic fertilizer, or you have some leftover uh, synthetic fertilizer for your lawn in the garage, you can start right away, and you could grow some, you know, some nice warm season stuff, some tomatoes, some eggplants, some herbs. I think peppers are super easy to grow. Um, you could even... Um, uh, uh, 
maybe even do some um, green onions. I'm trying to look for my my map of what I'm exactly I'm going to do. I'm going to do a lot of herbs just because um, she does a lot. The nutrition educator tries to promote using herbs over salt consumption. And then we just we've had this like really huge. Um, request for herbs and drinks and making things with mint and making basil lemonade. Do you condition the bales again if you're using them a second year? I would say you would definitely have to add in some nitrogen into there. I mean, yes, they're probably the, the bacteria is still forming uh, the soil, but I would think that you would have to add some nitrogen to get that um, to get that good plant growth so I don't know if you'd have to condition them the same way but I do know that he actually has been promoting using them again if they still have some you know container formation to them but you know what you can do in the end is just put them on a compost pile and get you a new bale just to have it to where it's you know that tight bale but I would think you'd have to add some more nitrogen. I actually had this flat of basil and I actually thought that I was getting because we had that late frost and my basil got nipped and it had all these necrotic brown lesions on it and so of course what's the first thing I thought I thought I had downy mildew on the basil because there's a lot of problems with organic growers you know getting downy mildew on their basil from the seeds um, but you know I kept looking at it under the microscope and I couldn't find any of the actual brown brown growth on underside of the lesions so I just let it grow out a little bit let it grow out a little bit I didn't have downy mildew I actually was gonna throw them all away but it would just frost on basil and downy mildew have the same types of symptoms so it was like really necrotic leaves you know, um, wilting, deformed um, growing shoots. How much does the whole setup cost? Um, um, well, if you only do the bale, uh, I, I've, I've heard there anything from $3. I think I paid $7 a bale. Um, uh, I've paid, um, you know, maybe about, I'm doing 25 bales, so I've paid maybe about $100 on fertilizer, um, but I did organic, um, and I bought extra fertilizer, so that's going to be my fertilizer cost for the whole entire season. Um, the fence post, um, the irrigation is the most expensive, uh, a couple hundred bucks. Um, the fence post, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm obviously I'm going to have to buy new, but um, probably something you could have around. Um, so I don't know if it was really that expensive. I think the irrigation is the most expensive, and the fertilizer obviously is a a, a larger expense. Can you review the order of soil, paper towel, seeds, etc. when plant? So you just so you don't you don't have to ha it doesn't have to get to 105 degrees before you plant the the um, the seeds, but it does if you're going to plant the transplants. But you just put a layer of soil down, then you put your paper towels on top, then you put your seed on top of the paper towel, and that will prevent it from moving. And obviously, you know, you have those small seeds and, you know, your your fingers fumble around and then before you know it, you have 25 cilantro plants in one little inch area. But that's a great way to keep the seeds. And then you put the soil on top. And then that, you water it in and you want to, you know, keep those seeds watered because you never want them to dry out. But because you have that paper towel there, 
they're not going to really move. Any ideas of what to do if someone started their bales on the wrong side? Big deal. Keep going. Um, you might have to put a log on the side to keep it stabilized. Or plant the sides with some flowers, some marigolds, some impatience. To, that'll help keep it in a container. But, you know, just keep going. It sounds, it, I don't think that that is the worst thing you could have done. I think the worst thing that you can do is plant and not cook the bales first. The only reason they want you to plant that way is that it stays in more of a container form. You have that, 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 that string keeps the straw bales together. I am so happy that winter is over. I have been gardening and weeding like crazy. And even though this job I spend, um, you know, before I had this job, I was, you know, always out in the greenhouse watering. I had boots and a ponytail. Now I have this job and I'm sitting behind the computer all day. Man, am I loving the gardening lately. Just having a great time and so happy that you know it's sunny and there's I can get outside okay well I do want to thank three people sorry um, I want to thank Kari and Candace and Martha for really making this possible for the rest of us and making this um, great program available to all the map gardeners and all um, the community members in Illinois. They really keep made this pro. They made it so easy for me to do. Um, so I wanted to thank them and um, I want to thank you guys and keep continuing to to uh, log in and see these Four Seasons tele webinars because they really are um, um, a great resource and cool because sometimes they bring up these really interesting topics. Ooh, someone's starting right away. <laughs> okay, and we're off in one hour